Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilson, lecturer in politics and faculty fellow of Butler College at Princeton University. His interests include American constitutional law, American political thought, and Western political thought. In addition to authoring or co-editing several books on American government and its political institutions, he has co-edited a two-volume edition of the political writings of Alexander Hamilton. I have the nice hardback volume two right here. There was a special deal on Amazon one day, and uh, so I have my special copy right there. Uh, published about five years ago by Cambridge University Press, now available in paperback, which you'll see he has his paperback today. His writings have appeared in the Review of Metaphysics, the American Political Science Review, Academic Questions and Law Reviews, and has chapters edited volumes. Among other distinguished appointments from 1984 to 1987, he served as research associate to two chief justices of the United States, Warren Berger and William Rehnquist. I forgot about that. I read the Bible from time to time. From 1996 to 2004, he served as acting president and then executive director of the National Association of Scholars and was editor of the journal Academic Questions. Been an editor of Interpretation, a journal of political philosophy since 1982. Holds degrees from North Carolina State University, Northern Illinois University, and the Catholic University of America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilson for his talk, Alexander Hamilton, Beyond the Musical. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's my first visit to King's College, uh, uh, TKC. I, I, you must think of KFC and hear that a lot. <laughs> I do think of that. But, um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be visiting today uh, with my old friend David Tubbs, Professor Tubbs, and I have known each other for many years. He was a visiting fellow in the program that I'm executive director of at Princeton. And uh, this year we have uh, another uh, King's College professor visiting, uh, Professor Steele Brand, if any of you have had. Professor Brand's classes. Uh, you won't get to see him in the classroom this year. We've got him, <laughs> uh, gladly. But um, I want to thank uh, Professor Tubbs uh, and King's College for hosting me today. Uh, it's a great honor, uh, especially on Constitution Day or close enough for Constitution Day. I don't know if you know that Constitution Day really exists because of a law that was passed a number of years ago, a federal law, um, uh, insisting that university, colleges and universities that accept federal funds, whether student loans or grants and so forth, uh, all of them need to have a, a Constitution Day event within, I think they said within seven days of either side of Constitution Day. This is qualifying. No, but close, <laughs> close enough. Who's watching? Well, that's a good question. But the first Constitution Day event at Princeton University, I re do recall, was a panel discussion of whether Constitution Day was constitutional. <laughs> this is a typical <laughs> Princeton sort of jujitsu move on anything uh, that's demanded of American citizens. So, uh, and look, I'm proof, you heard the colleges and universities I went to, I'm proof that you don't need to go to an Ivy League institution to end up at an Ivy League institution for your, for your career. Uh, that's, that's me. Um, and uh, so I'll get on with it. Uh, I, how many of you have seen the musical, by the way, one way or another? Uh, probably no more than half. Um, that's, that's impressive. I too have seen it. Not the, not the, um, was it Disney or whoever did the, you know, the, the video, the tape, the first uh, cast performances. And uh, that's the cast I saw initially. And uh, I didn't expect to like it, frankly. And, and 
Not that I expected it to be a terrible distortion of the life and thought of Alexander Hamilton. I didn't know what to expect there. I was kind of encouraged by the fact that the uh, historical advisor to the musical was uh, the biographer of Hamilton, Ron Chernow. And I had read Chernow's biography and thought it was a masterpiece. It's a wonderful biography and I would recommend it to anybody interested in American history, American founding period, uh, Alexander Hamilton himself. It wasn't, so it wasn't my worry about the content. It was the music I was worried about, I, of that generation where, you know, two, three minute 60s pop songs are about all I could take. Uh, so I thought, no hip hop, rap, uh, it's going to be a disaster for me. And it wasn't. I loved the musical. It was really terrific. It even had some songs that were I could hum to and stuff. So it was very, I was relieved and also impressed uh, with, with what uh, that brilliant young man had, had done there. Um, and then I saw it a second time. Uh, with students from Princeton, from the class I was teaching on Hamilton, and it had the second cast. It wasn't the original one. And it just wasn't, maybe I was too jaded by then, but it just didn't impress me as much as that first cast uh, that was so exciting, and to see the actual uh, of playwright and uh, composer uh, in action was, was a real thrill. So anyway, I'm glad that those of you who have seen it have seen it. Those of you who haven't, I hope you get a chance to. I'll, I'm happy to talk more about the musical in the Q&A if you want me to, and I'll allude to it now and then in my remarks. Um, uh, I, I, I have a few small criticisms of it, but you know, uh, on the whole, I was, I was terribly impressed with it. So, I want to set the mood uh, with two questions. Uh, two, I'm sorry, two quotations. I just had cataract surgery. This is the first attempt at reading anything since the uh, surgery, so I'll give it a go. Uh, the first quotation is from the eulogy uh, for Hamilton by his friend and political ally, Fisher Ames, just days after Hamilton's death. This is Ames. He said, my heart penetrated with the re remembrance of the man grows liquid as I write. And I could pour it out like water. I could weep too for my country, which mournful as it is, does not know the half of its loss. It deeply laments when it turns its eyes back and sees what Hamilton was. But my soul stiffens with despair when I think what Hamilton would have been. Second quotation, certainly applicable to Hamilton's life, is from an early 19th century book review by the Scottish historian and polymath Thomas Carlyle. Those of you who uh, have seen the musical will see how this describes Hamilton. Quote, no man lives without jostling and being jostled. In all ways, he has to elbow himself through the world, giving and receiving offense. To paint a man's life is to present these things, end quote. Okay, nothing I say or, or could sing, uh, compare with the successful play uh, that Moran brought to New York City a little, what, what how many years, seven years ago perhaps now? Um, so forgive me if I fail to add to the Hamilton excitement uh, much, much uh, that's not already well known. My own field's political thought, as was mentioned. Uh, today though, I'll focus not only on Hamilton's political and economic thought, but also his extraordinary life and times. Um, though, as with all American founding fathers, his thought is a central part of his life and times. Let me try to sketch Hamilton's remarkable life. 
born in the British West Indies, either in 1755 or 1757, though the biography by Ron Chernow, on which the musical is based, argues for 1755, Hamilton's descendants and Hamilton himself claim 1757, as does Hamilton's gravestone in the cemetery of Trinity Church nearby. Um, uh, fittingly located at the intersection of Wall Street, Hamilton, and Broadway. Um, in fact, here's a research project for someone, an enterprising a student. If you could figure out why his gravestone over, who was it that dictated the words on Hamilton's gravestone, including his uh, age. That would be of great interest to me because, as I say, Ron Chernell says 1755. Hamilton himself thought it was 1757. It's on his gravestone in 1757. But who, who instructed the maker of the gravestone to date it at 1757? Uh, that would be of great interest to me, and actually of a lot of historians who haven't been able to resolve the issue. Um, his mother, uh, Rachel Fawcett, had married at 16 years old, and that marriage foundered, and Rachel took up with a Scottish fortune seeker, James Hamilton. When Hamilton was eight years old, now I'm going by the 1757 birth date here, when Hamilton was eight years old, Rachel and James move with their two boys to a Danish colony in the Indies, St. Croix. Hamilton's father abandoned the family soon after, never to be seen again. Hamilton's mother, who, according to uh, accounts, had both wits and beauty, opened a small store to support the children and herself. She, by the way, was French Huguenot. Uh, Three years later, when Hamilton was 11, she died of a fever, with Hamilton lying next to her, um, gravely ill with the same illness. And the orphaned Hamilton inherited nothing and began work as a clerk in a trading firm on the island, soon becoming the company's de facto manager. Now, a couple of notes on Hamilton's childhood, if one can call it a childhood. We do not know very much, uh, amazingly little, when you think of some of the other founders whose lives were well told often by themselves. One of the more striking features of Hamilton's mind and character is his forward-looking nature. He rarely looked back. He left no written record of those childhood times. And his children said that his only mention of those early years was his recounting his attending a Jewish day school in the Indies, where his teacher had him stand on the table and recite from memory the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. There's a larger story to be told about the Jewish dimension of Hamilton's life. Um, and I'll simply recommend to you a really fine book, winner of the book prize of the, uh, of the uh, Association of, for the Study of the Revolution, uh, a book by Andrew Porwancher that came out about two years ago with Harvard University Press on the hidden Jewish life or something like that, Alexander Hamilton. Not that Hamilton identified as a Jew, but in fact he identified as a Christian. But uh, there are good reasons to think that his upbringing as a young boy was Jewish, that his mother had converted to Judaism in order to marry her first husband, and so on in the Indies. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to Andrew's great book. Um, a second note, um, the earliest writing of Hamilton to survive was a letter to his young friend, Edward Ned Stevens when Hamilton was 12 years old. 
Another reason I think 1757 is the right date is that this sounds like a 12-year-old because by the time Hamilton was 15 and 16, he was winning literary prizes and he, he, he couldn't have been 14 when he wrote this because uh, it, it's so far from being deserving of a literary prize. So uh, I'll go with 12. He said this to his buddy Ned. Ned, my ambition is prevalent that I contemn the groveling and condition of a clerk, or the like, which he was, to which my fortune, etc., condemns me, and would willingly risk my life, though not my character, to exalt my station. I shall conclude, he said, saying I wish there was a war. Doesn't that sound like you at 12 years old? <laughs> As it happened, Hamilton found his war. A letter the 15-year-old Hamilton wrote to his absent father, describing from a Christian perspective a terrible hurricane that had devastated his island, was published in a St. Croix paper and was so eloquent, moving, and pious that it inspired a group of patrons to send Hamilton to the American colonies in North America for an education. There, uh, my own university, Princeton, uh, made its worst admissions decision in its history by turning him down. Um, and uh, so he enrolled in the other King's College, now Columbia University. I say perhaps the worst admissions decision, but I've met many parents who disagree with me uh, about that. Uh, though a brilliant student, Hamilton dropped out of college in 1775 <clears throat> to join a New York militia and fight against the British in the American War for Independence. He was soon noticed by the Army hierarchy for his self-taught knowledge of military matters and was appointed in 1777 as an aide-de-camp to the great commander of the Continental Army, George Washington, a position Hamilton held for four years. It was then uh, that one of the greatest collaborations in the political history of the world, the partnership of Washington and Hamilton, was forged. Now, when you think about it, Let's say Hamilton began with Washington in 1776. He dropped out of the college in 75. That would make Hamilton, what, 19 years old when he becomes the right-hand man of the great Washington. Um, an unhappy episode of those military years led to Hamilton's resignation. We know this from an account of it in a letter from Hamilton to his father-in-law. Hamilton had married Elizabeth Schuyler in December of 1780, and Hamilton returned to Washington's staff a few weeks later. Washington and Hamilton passed each other on the stairs at their winter headquarters in New York State, and Washington asked to speak with Hamilton. Hamilton said that he'd be available momentarily, but he first had to deliver an urgent order. Hamilton delivered the order. Rushing back to see Washington, he was delayed on army business by Marquis de Lafayette for what Hamilton says was one minute. Hamilton then ran up the stairs, finding General Washington at the top of them. Hamilton reports that Washington, in a quote, very angry tone, end quote, said, quote, Colonel Hamilton, you have kept me waiting at the head of the stairs these 10 minutes. I must tell you, sir, you treat me with disrespect, end quote. Hamilton replied, <clears throat> quote, I am not conscious of it, sir, but since you have thought it necessary to tell me so, we part. quite astounding. To which Washington replied, 
Very well, sir, if it be your choice. Two proud men, each with a incredibly powerful sense of personal honor, with Hamilton willing to abandon a strategic relationship with the person broadly regarded as the greatest man of the age, and the certain leader if the revolution were successful of a new American empire. Instead of a personal rupture, however, Hamilton and Washington remained on intimate professional terms. Washington gave Hamilton the command of a light infantry battalion, and Hamilton distinguished himself for bravery during the siege of Yorktown, which led to the British surrender. Hamilton had found his war and had gained a reputation for heroism. I should say, Hamilton chafed those years uh, as uh, Washington's most intimate military advisor uh, because he himself was not in the field of battle, but was really serving in his view as a kind of secretary to the commander. And I had begged Washington to give him a command for years. And it was only after their, their breach that Washington gave it to him and Hamilton had that opportunity for heroism that he dreamt of as a lad. Hamilton's storied political career effectively begins in 1782, after the war had concluded and his first of eight children, Philip, was born. He threw himself into the study and practice of law, becoming the finest lawyer of his generation, a legal mind of whom John Marshall, regarded as the greatest Chief Justice of the United States, said that Hamilton's intellectual reach was such that he, John Marshall, was a mere taper in the new day sun. It was Hamilton who wrote the report to the Congress under America's first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, on behalf of James Madison and others, calling for a convention to draft a new constitution. It was Hamilton who spoke for six hours at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, calling for an elected president and Senate who would serve for life unless impeached. An outline of government that gave ammunition to his political enemies in their efforts to delegitimize Hamilton and his Federalist allies as anti-Republican monarchists. It was Hamilton who organized the writing and publishing project in explanation and defense of the proposed Constitution that we now know as the Federalist Papers. Anybody here read any of the Federalist Papers? A few of you, highly recommend it. One of the two best books on understanding American politics, I think, the other being uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Of the 85 Federalist essays that initially appeared in 87 and 88 in New York newspapers and then were reprinted in other states, John Jay contributed five essays, James Madison contributed 29 essays, and Hamilton contributed 51 essays, including, what a run, the final 21 essays. I think it's probably the case that many of those latter essays of Hamilton's, those 21, weren't read by uh, Hamilton, uh, by, I'm sorry, by Madison or Jay. Uh, they had moved on to other things, and Hamilton was still scribbling. That's what's his way, scribbling away. It was Hamilton who went into the New York State Convention to advocate New York's approval of the proposed new constitution. Facing an opposition in the convention of at least two anti-federalists for every one pro-constitution federalist, converting by the power of persuasion his opposition two to one to a majority to narrowly approve the ratification of the constitution. It was Hamilton whom President Washington appointed with the consent of the U.S. Senate 
As the first Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, a position he held for more than five years, becoming what many of historians have labeled a de facto prime minister for the American government. I, I might mention here that he lasted longer in the Washington administration than did Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson left at least a year, uh, maybe a year and a half earlier than Hamilton. And there, there are good reasons for that. I mean, Jefferson left Paris at Washington's request to come back to the United States to be the first Secretary of State. And Jefferson thought that he was going to be the de facto Prime Minister as <laughs> Secretary of State. But he, he didn't. He and Hamilton did not know one another. They encountered one another a little bit, but they were not friends. They were not real acquaintances. And he didn't know what he was up against within that first cabinet. And he quickly felt that his duties had been hijacked by the Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton. And so he became quite unhappy uh, and went into opposition, frankly, to the Washington administration. Um, it was Hamilton, sadly, in 1797, who writes an extraordinary public confession of an extramarital affair with one Mariah Reynolds back in 1791. That's when the affair took place. That would place it at probably during the period he was writing one of his three great state um, reports, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, the one on manufacturers. Um, causing serious damage to its political reputation. The musical makes much of this affair, of course. The context was an accusation that it appeared in an opposition newspaper that Hamilton was publicly corrupt, that he did, and that he had illicitly speculated in treasury funds when he was treasury secretary using Mr. James Reynolds, Mariah's husband, as his agent. This was the accusation. Hamilton's pamphlet was his defense that it was his own money at issue. It had been paid as blackmail to Mariah Reynolds' husband to hide Hamilton's affair with Mariah. So this is a lengthy pamphlet. I don't know that I would recommend it, frankly. Um, but it has a certain... Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, you know, it has a it has value in trying to figure out why he would write what he wrote there. Uh, I think there are reasons, uh, but uh, you have to work at it. Um, was it passed over this pamphlet by Hamilton's friendly acquaintances? You know, when they kind of looked the other way when this thing came out, an embarrassment of their friend. No, here's a public comment from the clergyman who administered Hamilton's last rites. Well, listen to this, uh, this pastor. It was surely enough that he had impoverished himself while he was enriching the Commonwealth. That's Secretary of the Treasury. But it was beyond measure insulting to charge him under such circumstances with invading the public purse. See where his focus is on the charge of corruption. Nobody believed the charge, and least of all the slanderers who brought it. But Washington had been vilified, and how should Hamilton escape? The virtuous saw with regret that he stopped to repel it, this false charge of corruption. And with anguish that in regard to a private aberration, his defense contained a disclosure of which they admired the ingenuousness, but deplored the occasion while they wept over a spot in a blaze of excellence. That's a pastor's lament. Then there's Hamilton's great 19th century biographer, or biography I would recommend to this day as one of the finest of Hamilton, focusing on his uh, statesmanship. 
written by the historian and statesman Henry Cabot Lodge. This comment on the pamphlet, the manliness of the act, the self-inflicted punishment, and the high sense of public honor thus exhibited silenced even his opponents, end quote. Private vice, public virtue. Hamilton is most remembered as the architect of the American system of public finance, right? Which provided the monetary and fiscal structures and policies that serviced the debt accrued during the revolution, restored American public credit, created the first national bank, established the U.S. Mint, and much else besides. His report on public credit, his report advocating the chartering of a national bank, his opinion on the constitutionality of that bank, and his report on the subject of manufacturers are among the greatest state papers ever written. And all written, by the way, in a two-year two period. It is this period of Hamilton's public life that leads to the rupture of his friendship with James Madison and his professional relationship with Thomas Jefferson. Indeed, that, um, that break between, uh, of Hamilton with uh, Madison and Jefferson uh, results in the emergence of America's two-party system with the two parties, Hamilton's and Jefferson's, having as bitter and vituperative a mutual hostility as America's two parties today. Tough times for founding brothers. Washington, however, though losing his regard both for Madison and for Jefferson, never wavered in his gratitude for the counsel of and his affection for his fellow warrior and statesman, Alexander Hamilton. One story from this period. Hamilton's proposal to Congress to establish a national bank was opposed in the Congress by James Madison and in Washington's cabinet by his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson. Both Madison and Jefferson argued that a national bank incorporated by the government would violate the Constitution of the United States. Congress passed a bill establishing the bank, but under our Constitution, of course, the president would need to sign the bill before it could become law. Washington wasn't sure whether to sign it or to veto it. I mean, he was impressed that Madison and Jefferson both thought it was unconstitutional. Um, so we turned to Hamilton asking him for his view, since it was Hamilton's proposal to have a national bank in the first place, give me your constitutional defense. Hamilton produced a lengthy refutation of his opponent's constitutional arguments, and in doing so laid out a method for interpreting the powers of the national government that was afterwards adopted by all branches of our political system giving us the energetic national government we have today. That's remarkable enough, but here's the backstory. Joseph Story, probably the greatest legal scholar of the first century of American history, though he acknowledged Hamilton's superiority and sheer brilliance, said that Washington said to Hamilton, you must answer the objections or I won't sign the bank bill. Here's story, Justice Story's account. That evening, General Hamilton told his wife to give him a cup of strong coffee. He said he shouldn't come to bed that night as he was to write all night. That night, he wrote the argument of 80 pages. This is story talking here, Justice Story which contains all that has since been said or can be said in favor of the constitutionality of a bank, and it is unanswerable. Wow, such was the furious, I almost want to say feverish, dedication of Hamilton to arguing 
and arguing for what he saw as the public interest. He was essentially a fighting man, and with a tireless activity of mind. In 1793, after a thorough discussion with his cabinet, Washington issued his famous neutrality proclamation, which informed the world and American citizens of America's neutrality in the war, then breaking out between Great Britain and revolutionary France. Jefferson's party, calling themselves Republicans, challenged the constitutionality of the proclamation and it fell to Hamilton to launch, under the pseudonym Pacificus, an aggressive defense of Washington's actions through seven newspaper essays, and then nine more, those he signed no Jacobin. These essays framed our still existing understanding the relative powers of the President and the Congress when it comes to matters of war and peace and the interpretation of treaties with foreign nations. That same year, Hamilton and his wife contracted yellow fever while in Philadelphia. Then, and until late 1800, the capital city. Here's a glimpse of the distasteful lengths that Jefferson, Washington's Secretary of State, was willing to go in his contempt for Hamilton. Jefferson to James Madison, while the fever killed one out of 10 inhabitants in Philadelphia. Here's Jefferson. Hamilton is ill of the fever, as is said. He had two physicians out at his house the night before last. His family think him in danger, and he puts himself so by his excessive alarm. He had been miserable several days before from a firm persuasion he should catch it. A man as timid as he is on the water, as timid on horseback, as timid in sickness, would be a phenomenon if the courage of which he has the reputation in military occasions were genuine. His friends who have not seen him suspect it is only an autumnal fever he has. <laughs> You know who treated Hamilton and his wife and restored them to health? Ned Stevens, his childhood friend. In 1794, a group of insurgents in western Pennsylvania took up arms to resist a federal tax on whiskey that was Hamilton's brainchild. At a time when presidents really did act as commanders in chief, Washington set out to lead the army of 12,000 men. Hamilton, still Treasury Secretary, was placed in charge of the War Department. To do that back then, I guess. Became Acting Secretary of War because the uh, Secretary of War at the time was on vacation. And he rode out with Washington to meet and subdue the insurgency. Why did he go at a time his wife was terribly ill? with what turned out to be an ill-fated pregnancy for the child. Because he wrote, the whiskey tax was his policy, so it was his responsibility to defend it on the Pennsylvania frontier. Can you imagine today's policymakers feeling that kind of political duty? Hamilton retired from the government long, long thereafter, but not before submitting massive new reports to Congress on its fiscal program and recommended plans for paying the national debt. As he exited government service, President Washington wrote him a letter that must have helped to salve the frazzled soul of a much vilified statesman by that time. Quote, in every relation which you have borne to me, I have found that my confidence in your talents, exertions, and integrity has been well placed." End quote. Over the next year, Hamilton resumed the practice of law in New York, but remained active in defense of the Washington administration, writing, sigh, 28 essays, this time as Camillus, defending the highly controversial treaty with Great Britain negotiated by John Jay, Jay Treaty. 
I should mention that Hamilton not only picked up his quill pen, he went out into the streets of New York to speak at a rally in favor of the treaty. During his speech, a rowdy group of treaty opponents began to throw rocks at him, one of which struck Hamilton in the head. Hamilton is reported to have shouted, if you use such knockdown arguments as these, I must retire. Hamilton's Federalist friend, George Cabot, wrote of this episode, quote, the Jacobins were prudent to endeavor to knock out Hamilton's brains to reduce him to an equality with themselves. <laughs> Hamilton remained the leader of the Federalist Party throughout his years of retirement from the government, writing prolifically under pseudonyms and sometimes in his own name for the newspapers, and keeping up a constant correspondence with other Federalist Party leaders. His last act as a statesman was in the election of 1800, when the House of Representatives deadlocked over the choice of Jefferson or Aaron Burr for the presidency. Hamilton, befitting his distinguished leadership of a major party, persuaded Federalists inclined to vote for Burr to instead vote for Jefferson, whom it was obvious the people wished to be their president, thus giving the election to Jefferson. As he wrote to his ally, Governor Morris, during that contest, quote, if there be a man in the world I ought to hate, it is Jefferson. With Burr, I have always been personally well. But the public good must be paramount to every private consideration. The public good, vintage Hamilton. As his biographer Lodge wrote, quote, in a time when American nationality meant nothing, Hamilton alone grasped the great conception in all its fullness and gave all he had of will and intellect to make its realization possible. He alone perceived the destiny which was in store for the Republic, end quote. You say, did you mention Aaron Burr? You would probably like me to say something about the duel in which the sitting vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, killed the great Hamilton. I have a theory about that, but uh, I'll save it. Maybe there'll be an opportunity uh, in the Q&A. Thanks to Miranda's musical, Hamilton currently holds uh, an apparently unassailable place in the first rank of the American founders. To most minds, Hamilton belongs with that handful of men, Washington, Jefferson, John Adams, Madison, Ben Franklin, whose contributions to establishing the American Republic are most worthy of our remembrance and our study. Hamilton's contributions as a political thinker, however, are less appreciated than they should be. To be sure, there have been numerous scholarly studies, books, articles of his political thought. The output here, however, has not been as great as it might be, given the tremendous amount that Hamilton wrote about politics and his almost invariable recurrence to fundamental principles whenever he examined the political question. Hamilton rarely addressed an issue that came to his attention without relating it to some enduring aspect of human nature, some fundamental political principle, some axiom or maxim of conduct, even as he also reminded his readers of the role of prudence in statesmanship by emphasizing that some principles, such principles and maxims often admitted of exceptions in particular circumstances. Hamilton lived only to be 47 years old, so I claim. Contrast his rather brief life to that of other leading American founders. George Washington, 67, Franklin, 84, Jefferson, 83, Madison, 85, John Adams, 90. Yet his intellectual and literary powers resulted in an astonishing quantity of significant and influential economic, legal, and political thought. 
I've mentioned some of his best known writings already. In addition, Hamilton wrote influential pamphlets during the pre-revolutionary stage of the American colonists' conflict with Great Britain in 1774 and 75 when he was a teenage college student. Hundreds of letters and reports drafted for Washington during Hamilton's four years as Washington's aide-de-camp and secretary. Many series of essays addressing the fundamental political controversies of his time, all uh, up to and into Thomas Jefferson's presidency, during which Hamilton wrote 18 articles criticizing, as Lucius Crassus, the Jefferson administration's policies in 1801 and 1802. But you sense the scope of his literary achievement, amounting to 27 volumes in the official papers of Alexander Hamilton. And we've said nothing of his law practice, another five thick volumes, or his voluminous personal correspondence. It's difficult to do justice to Hamilton's statesmanship, just as it's difficult to do justice to any great person's importance and accomplishments. Hamilton played a role in large historical dramas in which the fate of the Republic was implicated. How would history have been different if the, or if the orphaned Hamilton had left his home in the Danish West Indies for, say, London or Paris, rather than for the American colonies? We can't really know, of course, though we can certainly speculate that given his exceedingly humble origins, in a world in which mobility between social classes in the old world was infrequent, the ambitious young Hamilton chose the right destination for the unfolding of his talents, the relatively democratic world of America, characterized by what Tocqueville described as equality of condition. I'd like to devote the remainder of my remarks to what, in my view, are two of Hamilton's greatest and most enduring contributions to American political thought. Let me sketch briefly Hamilton's understanding of human nature. One of his earliest writings, his admittedly interminable 1775 pamphlet, he was 18 years old, so his exuberance can be excused. The Farmer Refuted, it was called. Signed, A Sincere Friend of America. That was the pseudonym. Hamilton wrote, this is when he's still in college, by the way, political writers, say a celebrated author, who's that author? David Hume, in a famous essay, famous back then, famous now. An essay called That Politics May Be Reduced to a Science. Uh, I recommend that essay. He says, uh, they've established it as a maxim that in contriving any system of government and fixing the several checks and controls of the Constitution, every man ought to be supposed a knave. This is Hume. Hamilton quoting him, to have no other end in all his actions but private interest. By this interest we must govern him and by means of it make him cooperate to public good, notwithstanding his insatiable avarice and ambition. Still you know, Without this we shall in vain boast of the advantages of any constitution and shall find in the end that we have no security for our liberties and possessions except the good will of our rulers. That is, we should have no security at all. It is therefore a just political maxim that every man must be supposed a knave, end quote. Was this the, this the early Hamilton to be superseded by a later Hamilton? The way some insist on reading Plato's dialogues. Well, here is a more mature Hamilton. 1787 now, in the Federalist Papers, after plenty of grown-up experience in the army, at the virtuous Washington side, and in the political arena. Quote, a man must be far gone in utopian speculations who can seriously doubt that if these states should either be wholly disunited or only united in partial confederacies, the subdivisions into which they might be thrown would have frequent and violent contests with each other. To presume a want of motives for such contests as an argument against their existence would be to forget that men are ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious, end quote. Well, what about Hamilton at the end of his life? 
based on a wealth of experience and observation that eludes most of us. Here he writes to a political ally. Sometime after the ascendancy of his political rival, Jefferson, to the presidency, quote, nothing is more fallacious than to expect to produce any valuable or permanent results in political projects be relying merely on the reason of men. Men are rather reasoning than reasonable animals, for the most part governed by the impulse of passion." End quote. He then accuses the victorious Jeffersonians as having successfully courted the, quote, strongest and most active passion of the human heart, vanity, end quote. Why do I point to this aspect of Hamilton's thought? I believe it helps to explain both his emphasis on a stable, energetic, and competent national government is worrying that we'd be split into a, a variety of contending confederacies, um, and his dedication to what we might call, as he did, the spirit of enterprise. Indeed, these two commitments of Hamilton provide a useful contrast to the outlook of Hamilton's primary political opponent during their years together in the Washington administration, and then up until Hamilton's death in 1804, speaking, of course, of Jefferson. Hamilton was a nationalist. I mean nationalist not primarily in the sense that we are using it today in our public discourse as in championing the interests of one's own country and its residents before and even at the expense of the interests of other countries and their residents though his thought is fundamentally compatible with that perspective. I mean nationalist in the sense of continentalist, thinking in terms of the interests of the nation as a whole as distinguished from the sometimes differing interests of the particular states that constitute the nation. The purposes of the national government, as Hamilton argued, and as he understood the Constitution that came out of Philadelphia, were to provide for the security of the fledgling nation to advance its prosperity, to enhance its reputation among the nations of the world on which its independence and prosperity would ultimately depend. The fulfillment of these purposes, he argued, required a government that possessed energy and stability, dignity and public credit, confidence to the American people, and the respect of other countries and their governments. And so Hamilton, in all his work as a public man, sought to strengthen and broaden the general, by which he meant the national authority. And here we see develop a serious breach between Hamilton on the one side and Madison and Jefferson on the other, resulting in the rise of what all the American founders, themselves included, denounced as most dangerous to a system of ordered liberty, political parties. Hamilton's Federalists, Jefferson's Republicans. Why did the Jeffersonians choose the party label Republican or sometimes Democrat? Because their intention was to persuade the public that Hamilton and the Federalist administration in which he served were in truth monarchists intent on establishing dictatorial power, consolidating the union by annihilating the states and even attaching the country as a vassal state to its former master, Great Britain. Now, as silly as all that sounds today, the campaign to paint the anti-slavery, orphaned, immigrant, self braved man, Hamilton, as the anti-Republican, American elitist, and Caesar, and the plantation slave master with the advantages of an aristocratic upbringing and education, Jefferson, as a man of the people and the apostle of democracy, was so successful as to lead Franklin Roosevelt to write that thanks to Jefferson's heroic efforts, the country was spared Hamilton's aristocracy of wealth and power. All honor, by the way, to the Broadway musical for rejecting that prevailing myth. It is true, however, that Jefferson had a much more modest understanding of the purposes and powers of the national government and saw little or nothing to fear in the powers and ambitions of state politicians and state government. 
Indeed, Hamilton correctly observed that for Jefferson, quote, state government and republicanism are convertible terms, end quote. Hamilton was the opposite as he saw the real danger to be the, quote, subversion of the national authority by the preponderancy of the state governments, end quote. As for the Jeffersonian's accusation that he was unfriendly to republicanism, Hamilton declared, quote, as to my own political creed, I give it to you with the utmost sincerity. I am affectionately attached to the Republican theory. I desire above all things to see the equality of political rights exclusive of all hereditary distinctions firmly established by a practical demonstration of its being consistent with the order and happiness of society, end quote. He wrote, quote, the only enemy which republicanism has to fear in this country is in the spirit of faction and anarchy, end quote. Jefferson disagreed, quote, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing and is necessary in the political world as storms in the physical, end quote. I have more but I think I'm going to summarize uh, the rest of it off the cuff here, so we can have a little back and forth. The latter part of my remarks was gonna be devoted to the two versions of political economy that you find represented by the two parties and by the two men, Jefferson and Hamilton. Jefferson is famous for saying that if there's a chosen, if ever there was a chosen people, it's, the farmer, the farmers. And they are the vessels of Republican virtue, agrarian virtue. What is that virtue? Self-sufficiency, right? Not being dependent on others for providing for your own and your family's needs. Uh, Jefferson despised the cities. Uh, despite his years in Paris, it only made him despise the cities more. Now, of course, he was living amidst uh, a fairly, you know, long in the tooth and corrupt aristocracy, and saw that on display, and that, that certainly uh, rankled him. But uh, his view was that an agricultural country is a Republican country. And the, um, the task for the statesman was to keep America agricultural as long as possible. Now, he didn't think it would stay agricultural forever, but he didn't think any encouragement should be given to commerce and in particular to manufacturing. He said, let manufacturing be done in Europe. We don't need it here, other than the, the manufacturing that takes place within the home. Uh, very much against uh, uh, that kind of uh, economy. Uh, we'll import their manufacturers and we'll export our agricultural products and in a world based on free trade, what could go wrong? And we'll stay Republican rooted in our agricultural existence. Hamilton said, well, farming is all well and good, and we need all of that, but why not also have manufacturing and commerce? Why? Because the human mind is constituted in such a way that if it is not given objects to pursue to its liking, it will collapse into mediocrity and laziness. Farming is not for everyone. It certainly wasn't for Hamilton. He couldn't even garden, let her farm farm. He was a city boy, always had been. Um, as one of my friends, Darren Staloff, who, who I think uh, Professor Tubbs knows, Darren once said, yeah, but you know, when the Whiskey Rebellion happened, he says, you know, Jefferson looked out at those rebelling uh, uh, pioneers with their stills 
uh, avoiding federal taxes and saw that agricultural virtue that he cherished. Hamilton looked out there and saw a bunch of drunks shooting squirrels from their porches. Uh, there's something to that. Uh, two totally different imaginations at work in terms of ways of life. And Hamilton argued that by providing more objects for human activity and energy, for people to pursue in their livelihoods, the mind will be developed. New inventions will be produced. A kind of, you know, a, a birth of all kinds of social and economic activities will appear that right now we know nothing of because of our rootedness in the soil, right? So Hamilton became the advocate of his generation for what we think of as a commercial republic, okay? And he was untroubled by the virtue question that Jefferson raised because he saw other virtues. He was just as much devoted to the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the kind of liberal democracy that we associate with the founding, but he had a very different view of what kind of way of life was, uh, would thrive best under those principles. And that led to this great difference. And I'll conclude by simply reading something I only discovered recently, should have known of it. And it is a letter of Jefferson to Benjamin Austin in 1816, long after Hamilton's gone. And uh, apparently his interlocutor had said, you know, what about you and the notes of the state of Virginia where you said that about the, uh, you know, the chosen people being the farmers and you denounced manufacturing and all of that. And Jefferson says, uh, uh, let's see. Um, Shall we make our own comforts or go without them at the will of a foreign nation? Now, this is a, think of Hamilton thinking these same thoughts. He doesn't get any attribution from Jefferson. Uh, we must now place, uh, we must now place the manufacturer by the side of the agriculturalist. Um, he who is against manufacturing must be for reducing us either to dependence on foreign nations or to be clothed in skins and to live like wild beasts in dens and caverns. I'm not one of these. Experience has taught me that manufacturers are now as necessary to our independence as to our comfort. So it's an amazing turnabout later in Jefferson's life, rooted in his experience. Uh, and I mean, to be, be fair to him, uh, the world hadn't turned out the way he expected. It was a much more unfriendly world than he anticipated in his free trade uh, reveries. Uh, turned out that uh, the world was filled with powers hostile to one another, with the power to block American commerce from bringing its goods to other European countries and getting manufacturers in return. So he said, we're becoming slaves, basically, to these foreign powers that hold this commercial uh, power over us. So we need to step up our manufacturing at home so we're not dependent on them. I mean, that's a very Hamiltonian thought. But with that, I'll just say, look, at the end of Hamilton's uh, life, he writes to Gouverneur Morris, I think this might actually, I don't think this is in the musical, you tell me if I'm wrong. It's kind of shocking. Um, he writes to Gouverneur Morris in 1802. You know, he's long out of government. His son Philip has now died from a duel. Uh, his eldest son. Um, uh, and he says to Morris, um, mine is an odd destiny. Perhaps no man in the United States has sacrificed or done more for the present Constitution than myself. And contrary to all my anticipations of its fate, 
as you know from the very beginning, I'm still laboring to prop the frail and worthless fabric. It's talking about the Constitution. Yet I have the murmurs of its friends, no less than the curses of its foes, for my rewards. What can I do better than withdraw from the scene? Every day it proves to me more and more that this American world was not made for me. Well, thank you very much.